Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Adventures of a Real Estate Investor. I'm Susie. And I'm Michael, and we're excited you joined us for this adventure. So today's very special guest is Tim McGarvey. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Excited to do this. Yeah, and I'm excited that you will kind of be like on our side of the world here soon. So it's going to be awesome. You're going to have a great trip and it's just cool when people are like also a little bit closer. So yay. <laughs> or they decide to travel. Yeah. True, true. Yeah. <laughs> all the time too. Yeah, absolutely. Tim, would you mind sharing with our with our listeners a little bit more about you and your background, like how you started investing in real estate? Yeah, of course. Well, I'm excited to be on your guys' show because my journey to real estate actually started on an adventure. I was traveling to Barcelona, Amsterdam, and Prague in 20. 15. And it was the first really like international trip I'd ever done outside of like, you know, North America really. And on that trip, I think it was an Amazon, you know, recommended book, the book on rental property, investing by Brandon Turner, Baker mm -hmm. Pockets book, randomly bought the book, went on the trip and it like completely changed my life and like view on passive income and being able to, I basically wanted to be able to do that trip like over again, whenever I wanted to. Yeah. And I was working a nine to five job at the time. And that just really completely rewired the way I thought about like finance and income and being able to, you know, how do I provide my own flexibility to be able to travel whenever I want to. So I basically went on a kind of a personal growth journey at that point and started educating myself on real estate, read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and, you know, the dozens of other books that are recommended. And I eventually bought a four unit apartment complex in Oakland, California. And that was my first real estate purchase. Did a house hack on that. So I lived in two out of the four units and, you know, fixed one of them up, got it rented, moved to the other one. And it was, it was quite the project. And I learned a ton along the way about like, you know, how to fix things up and then just, you know, how do you manage an asset? How do you deal with tenants? Just all the things along the way. So many things that you, you just don't learn reading books. So I got the real world kind of reps and doing, doing that experience. And then at that point I tried to figure out, you know, it wasn't a sustainable way to, I can't, I can't move into all of these different places. And it was a, it was a slow process building a you know, passive income that way. So I tried to figure out how do I, how do I scale this? What are the other things I could do in real estate to really grow a business and start to like scale this and, and make this go faster. And I started working a lot on generating off-market leads through online campaigns. So I did a lot of Facebook ads, Google ads, was still working my nine to five job. So I found time to do that. It was basically like taking phone calls and negotiating with sellers to, to buy properties out of state at that point. And so I started getting pretty good at that and wholesaled some, some deals virtually, uh, started to get my reps in, kind of figuring out how the, how the exit strategies work. And then fast forward, you know, five or six years later or whatever it is now, my, my main business is a, a wholesaling and investment business in North Carolina. I operated out of a Northern California and my business partners in Chicago. We got about 10 employees that in North Carolina. And some, some other states, actually, we have a few remote employees. And uh, yeah, that's our, that's our primary business. We're, we're growing steadily. We're in three MSAs in North Carolina. We're starting to look at some states outside of there. And the primary business is wholesaling at this point. And we do some rental property investing and uh, some small multifamily as well. I love that's it. Cool. I do have a question. How did you like going into the Facebook ads and such? How did you decide to do that at the very beginning? Right? Because that usually... Isn't like the first, like, Hey, this is what I'm going to do first. <laughs> Good question. It was Facebook advertising was a little bit different back then. It was a little bit more of the wild West, a lot less restrictions. And I basically needed something that I could do. You know, my, my nine to five job was construction management. I was on site, like managing ground up construction projects from like five in the morning till six at night. So I didn't have a ton of time to be like cold calling people and doing those like kind of old school off-market lead generation methods. Mm -hmm. So I wanted something I could set up on the weekend that would kind of work for me while I was at work and then be able to like, you know, call those leads back later and not have to like answer the phone live. So that was kind of, I almost kind of like reverse engineered, like what is the, what is the marketing method that like best ties into my lifestyle right now? And that kind of grew into learning more about, you know, doing online ads and kind of building an online brand and, and things from there. But that was the, the Facebook ads were the first thing that I really got into. And I think it was some like some YouTube videos that I saw on it back in the day. That's cool. Oh, that works. Question about your employees that you have in the Carolinas. Like you said you had 10 employees there. Like what 
what jobs, what roles do they have specifically there? Yeah. So our, our business really kind of has two, two sides to it as the acquisition side and the dispositions. So we're, and then I guess we have, we have a marketing, a marketing element to it too, the, the front end. So most of the people in North Carolina are acquisitions and dispositions. So they're negotiating with homeowners to homeowners and landlords to buy their properties. We also have a team of inspectors that are like the boots on the ground people that will drive to appointments. They'll take photos and videos of the property. They'll give the seller some information about our company, drop off a, a pamphlet and a business card, and let it basically let them know what the next steps are going to be. And then our sales team, we do have some local um, people in North Carolina on the sales team. We also have remote people out of state that will basically just negotiate on the phone with sellers like all day, every day. And then once we put the property under contract and we determine the exit strategy for it, we have a dispositions manager that's in North Carolina that will show that property to, to different investors. It's a lot of flippers, buy and hold investors, some more institutional buyers, hedge funds. And he basically manages the dispositions process. He's a former broker. So he kind of has connections to buyers in that world. So he understands the local market really well from, you know, kind of a tactical perspective. That's cool. What finally did it for you, for you to be like, okay, we need, I need to hire employees. I don't like negotiating with sellers on the phone. <laughs> and I was doing that for a year or two and I, I figured out a way to get through it. And we did, we did some deals, but it was not, it's definitely not my personality or my skill set. And that was the first major hire that we made was someone to do the acquisitions and negotiations on the phone. I was still doing my other job at that time too. And it just became so much of my phone would ring during the day and I had to talk to someone and then just doing two jobs at the, at the exact same time. So that was the key, the kind of the key first hire was having someone to do the neg negotiations and acquisitions. And I could focus more on the kind of the operations and the really like the, the business, business operations portions. How was that experience, right? Cause like giving up that level of control is still kind of hard, even if you don't like doing it. So like, do you still have that first hire or did, how many interviews did you go through at first? Cause I mean, this is something that I think a lot of people are curious about just with hiring employees in general. Yeah, it was, it was, it's a really good question. It was, it was really hard at first. We interviewed a bunch of different people and actually the first hire that we had, had more of a kind of a neutral role where they were helping us out with a lot of different things. And that didn't really go over it didn't, it didn't work out too well because they weren't specialized in any one thing. And it was just hard to, we ended up doing as much work training them as we did trying to do our jobs ourselves. Yeah. And, you know, as we were going through that, we got fortunate and we found someone who, who worked at a, a wholesaling company in Seattle. He'd worked there for three or four years, was an acquisitions manager over there, knew the industry like in and out. And he was moving to North Carolina because his fiance was going to do her doctorate at Duke. And so he actually reached out to us and found us and said, Hey, like, I don't know if you guys are interested, but you know, I've worked at a company like yours before. I'm going to be moving into the area in six months. And so we basically spent six months talking to him on the phone, getting to know him, seeing if he was going to be a good fit. And, uh, you know, fast forward a couple of years later, and he's like, like the linchpin to our business. Yeah. He's the, yeah, he knew more about the industry than we did in certain areas. And he taught us things about, you know, marketing strategies and all, and all types of things. So he was the we got really fortunate that we found him and he's like, you know, a real like centerpiece in our business right now. That's awesome. That is awesome. When you were like, I know he came to you and it took like six months to be like, okay, like, I think this can work. Were you three, I guess, technically ever like to put it in an easy term, like swimming in each other's swim lanes or like from the very beginning, was it like, okay, this is your role and your role only? Yeah, we, we've had to solidify the roles a little bit over time. But the, the culture at the company has always really a team environment and we all jump in and do things. I mean, it's a small business, it's 10 people. So we, we all like wear different hats. And I think we upfront, we kind of try to choose people that fit that role that have, you know, either backgrounds doing, they've worked at small companies before, maybe they've done like team sports before they have like experience working in groups and like just getting a job done. So now we've, we've gotten better and better at searching for people that kind of fit that role that they're like, yes, they're experts at doing the job that we want them to do and we're hiring them to do, but they also have that like entrepreneurial mindset of they'll come up with a new idea of, Hey, I think we could be doing this this way. Or, you know, if I'm out in, in, in Italy for a couple of weeks, like yeah. someone's not scared to jump in to you know, get something done that I would normally do. So we're, we've been intentional about trying to find people that kind of fit that fit that role of like 
they see the vision of like what we're trying to build and they're willing to, you know, to do what it takes along the way to, to, to get there. I like it. I'm just curious, like with 10 employees, I know you said it's small, but like, I'm sure you're still turning quite a bit of volume. Like, I'm just curious how many wholesale deals are you doing per month on average? Yeah, we probably do 10 to 15 a month at this point. Yeah. And then the, our average, our average deal spreads been about $24,000. Cool. Over the last couple of weeks, it's definitely, I mean, as you guys know, the, the market's shifting a little bit. So we're, we're yeah. trying to figure out like what, what adjustments we make. So it seems like the, the deal spreads are getting a little more thin at this, but, but yeah, we've been essentially able to double our revenue each of the last four quarters. That's exciting. Uh, yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what the, what the next couple of quarters hold with the, with all these shifts, but yeah, we found, we found a pretty, a pretty good thing the last, the last year or so. So that was, that was kind of my next question after I asked that was, and you lead, you led right into it. And I was just curious, like, what are you seeing in the market right now, as far as like the cooling off that's happening are, I know you might still have a pretty motivated buy and hold investor pool, but maybe not so much the flipper pool. What are you kind of seeing now? Yeah, we're, we're in an interesting position in the market because we work essentially 50% with sell sellers and 50% with buyers. So we have kind of two groups of people that we're always trying to balance that always need to be in sync with each other. If we're buying things at the wrong price, we can't resell them. Right. And if we, and it just, it doesn't, it doesn't work unless the pricing is equal on both, on both ends. We're like right in the middle of it. So on the, on the seller side, we're definitely seeing like a lag in education on where the market is. So over the last couple of weeks, we get a lot of phone calls and someone says, I want, I want $300,000 for my property. We'll say, okay, well, you know, a month ago, we might've been able to get that for you, but like interest rates have risen. All these things are happening in the market. Days on market are now increasing in your, in your neighborhood. Are, you know, are you aware of that? Like, and there's a, there's a lack of like education on that side. So we're having to do a lot of like kind of coaching through, you know, you, you see that comp that sold nine months ago that it doesn't really apply anymore because the one that's right next door to you has been sitting for 60 days now. So we're having to do a lot of that on the seller side. And we're starting to get a lot of phone calls back from people who we couldn't buy a property from, and then they ended up not being able to sell it. And now they're, you know, it's three months later and they're reaching back out to us. So I think that is starting to catch up a little bit. On the buyer side, when interest rates first started to rise, we thought that our hypothesis was hedge funds would be, would stay in the game and more like mom and pop people would, would sit it out. And it's kind of been the opposite where a lot of hedge funds and institutional buyers have really frozen. And if they haven't frozen, they've tightened up their criteria, their buying criteria to a point where it's like really hard to find something that works for them. But the middle size kind of mom and pop, it's not even a mom and pop size, but someone who's not institutional money and they're flippers or buy and hold guys who do, you know, 50 to 150 deals a year. Those are the people who are really interested in buying right now. Oh. And, and they've been, they've tightened up their criteria and they want to buy good deals. They're not buying everything in, in you know, projecting anticipation. But those have been our best buyers over the last couple of months of people who understand their local market really well, understand what a good, good deal is, and they do enough volume that they're not, you know, they're not scared to have their reps in. But it's almost like the, the new people and the institutional money who's like out of state, they've kind of, they're sitting on the sidelines for a bit. And the people, the local investors who are in that market that know it well are getting more selective, but they're still buying. And that's what, that's what we've seen over the last uh, call it, call it two months. Yeah. Wow. That's really cool. What do you think? I mean, and I know nobody like has a crystal ball, so there's no way to tell, but like, what do you think will happen with institutional? Really? I guess that's a better question. Just institutional. I was going to say new, but new people go all over the place. So they're kind of hard. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's a good question. It was, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen with, with institutional. It, it seems like we're getting back to a point where it's going to be a more like normal, healthy market. It's been so out of control for the last two years, especially on the wholesaling side, especially in, in our market. I think a lot of companies have built like unhealthy practices on, you know, buying something for the wrong price, knowing they can sell it, big money buying something for a ridiculous price because, you know, they, they have the money and they, and they have to buy something. So I think everyone's going to start cleaning up their practices on underwriting and what, what understanding what a deal really is. So I don't know. I don't, I don't know on that, on the institution. That, that, that's a big, a big question in our business right now is, you know, it's staying in tune with what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And, and a big part of what we're doing right now is just picking up the phone and talking to people before you could kind of, you could kind of buy a deal and you knew there was going to be a buyer and you'd kind of 
throw it out on an email blast and like someone was going to buy it. Mm -hmm. Now we're almost having to do it in reverse where we're picking up the phone and we're talking to buyers and we're saying, Hey, what are you interested in? What are you doing? What are you seeing out there? And then we're taking that information and we're kind of applying it back to our marketing on, oh, these, these neighborhoods aren't selling anymore. These price points people aren't interested in. And uh, we're almost working it in reverse where it's like, li listen to what the buyers want first and then go figure out how to get it versus the opposite strategy where it was go find something and someone's going to buy it. Yeah. Now, and I was going to add, like, I like that you say that, like figure out what the buyers want. Cause really to me, that feels a lot more like real estate. I mean, the other way is so much more fun because <laughs> you get so much more done. But like, once you figure out what like people do really want and need, I feel like it's actually easier at that point. Yes. There's like a little upfront work, but then afterwards it's like, oh, okay. Like we found the perfect one for this perfect person and it works, you know? And then you it, just deepen relationships. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think we're just getting back to like what a, again, what a healthy market looks like and what, what real estate has been prior to the last, the last couple of years. And I think there's really going to be, especially in, in my, in our, our wholesaling industry, a real separation of people who know what they're doing and have the fundamental, they're going through the fundamentals correctly versus people who have just got into it and are, are riding kind of that, that wave of an appreciating market that was it's, it's very, it was very forgiving for a long time. If you were making mistakes on pricing, because it was almost like if you just held a property long enough and you couldn't sell it and you waited a couple of months, all of a sudden you'd be able to sell it again. Where now if it's stable or going the other direction, you're not going to have very many exit strategies if you can't buy it at the right price. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. And, and on the multifamily side of things, we see that in our industry quite a bit, like where the past couple of years, a lot of people were buying these top markets like Phoenix, Houston, stuff like that, like, and just buying multifamily properties and then sitting on it for nine to 12 months and then reselling it for two X of their equity. Right. But they have never actually managed the property, right? They didn't complete a business plan or anything like that. Just bought it, held it, and then sold it again. Right. Just banking a hundred percent on appreciation. And so I think there's going to be a lot of these newer multifamily investors or you know, operators who have never actually had to operate a property are now going to be like, oh crap, I have to operate a property now and actually to make, to force the appreciation of it. So it'd be very interesting to see, maybe there'll be some good deals to buy here in the next six to nine months for us, which we're kind of looking forward to. Yeah. That's, that's what I, what I was kind of anticipating you saying that the forced appreciation part of it, I think a lot of people were bailed out by appreciation, but the people who know how to force it, there's going to be a lot of opportunities for, you know, people that, who had bought an asset and didn't you know, had banked on the appreciation and all of a sudden they don't have an exit strategy now and they're not going to be able to refinance because they're, you know, the underwriting numbers don't work anymore and they might be forced to sell. And there's going to be some pretty good properties, I think, in the next couple of years that become available because people aren't able to refinance it. Yep. Yeah, totally agree. So why wholesaling out of all of the strategies? Yeah. So it's a really good question. We, we never really intended to build a wholesaling business. We had one. I love it. That's how it always works. <laughs> yeah. We, we wanted to build a rental property portfolio and build passive income that way. And when we got into the North Carolina market, we, there wasn't as many two to four unit properties as we, there wasn't any inventory available of that product that we wanted and doing single family rentals turned out to just be, you know, the home prices were increasing way more quickly than rents. So there just wasn't a lot of cash flow in single families either. And we realized that the cash that we could generate through wholesaling would allow us to, you know, build up reserves to go invest in other types of deals. And it kind of ha happened organically where we call ourselves a wholesale company, but I see it more like we're like a lead generation company mm -hmm. and our primary exit strategy right now is wholesaling, but there definitely could be a day and, you know a year, two years where, you know, the tides shift a little bit and maybe we end up buying like 50% of the deals that come through our pipeline and we turn more into an investment business. So we're really generating off-market leads all the time. And, you know, right now we wholesale them, but it allows us to, you know, hire a team of employees, pay them well right now. And it generates a lot of cash flow right now versus like a couple hundred dollars a door over the next couple of years. You know, it allowed me to go full-time into real estate. My business partners full-time into real estate. So it's really like it, it generates the revenue right now to be able to do future investments. So a lot of times we'll cherry pick deals out of our pipeline that work really well for us. And we're able to do, build a, you know, a passive portfolio while we're generating the active, the active income. So I guess the long story short, it wholesaling provides active income for us to then like reallocate towards 
building a passive portfolio at the same time. No, that's awesome. Because I mean, there's just so many. So I was just more like interested in like, okay, no, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and really we see, you know, we do a lot of single families and small multifamily right now, two to four units, but we're starting to explore the idea of, you know, commercial multifamily land development, like the the wholesaling and like, you know, off-market lead generation really can apply to any type of asset. And that's really something that we're going to start exploring here in the next year or two is what other types of asset classes can we create a lead generation pipeline for whether the exit strategy is to sell it to someone else or to, like, to develop it ourselves. That like owning the lead ourselves and having control over the relationship with the seller, you know, that that's something that's like integral to our business. And we're trying to figure out what, what other verticals can we like stretch that into besides just the single family homes. So we're trying to build kind of these, you know, ancillary businesses and asset classes on top of the kind of that keystone single family, small multifamily business. Yeah, that's awesome because it's super important, right? Like when people get so focused on just like one single thing, it's like hard like to pivot, you know, it's like, okay, well, what do we do if something changes? And right now is a great example of that. Yeah. Well, when we first started our business, we had so many interests. We wanted to do like Airbnbs and we wanted to do boutique hotel renovations and all these like shiny object syndromes. And eventually we realized that like, None of those things would really like matter if we couldn't generate the leads for ourselves. And so we really made a focus on let's build this wholesale business first. We have all these other interests that we want to do, but once, once we can, you know, go into any market and negotiate with people off market and get, and get good deals, then we can do all of those other things around it. If we can like find the deal ourselves. So it, it was a really a conscious effort to like peel back from some of the things and be like, okay, maybe it's not the sexiest thing first, but like, let's build the wholesale business. Let's figure out how the pipeline works, make sure it's like bulletproof. And then we can go expand off of that. And that's really like the, the cornerstone to the, the future business portfolio. Awesome. It is. And just speaking of future business portfolio, I was just curious, like, cause at the beginning you mentioned, you know, you were looking forward to getting some passive income where you could spend time traveling more and stuff like that. What is the future? You know, cause like this is wholesaling, I know, from what I understand is very, very active. And especially a business with 10 people can be very active. Like you kind of mentioned, you you know, you're making active income now to passively invest in the future, but like, what is the strategy? Is it five, 10 years from now or, or sooner to transition all the active income now into passive income so you can do the things you want to do? Yeah, I think, I think as we, as we grow, I mean, we're still, you know, a young growing business. So I'm, I'm pretty, pretty heavily involved still, but the uh, people that we've hired, you know, have taken a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff off of my shoulders where, you know, me and my, my business partner, Mike, are able to focus on growth and expansion and kind of like the, the, the higher leverage items. And I think we'll keep continuing to do that of hiring people who are like, who are experts that can take the day-to-day -day wholesaling business things off of our plate. And we can go focus on, you know, if we want to do a development project that like might have returns for us in you know, five years out, we can go spend the time working on that thing because we know we're getting the, you know, the business is operating at a super high level. We're getting the, the active income from the wholesale business. So I think it's really about putting the systems and people in place in the wholesaling business, having it a plan to, to grow that and have it kind of work on its own. And then we can go do the, you know, I could take a couple of months off. I could go spend a couple of months working on development projects, those, those bigger kind of, yeah, those, those high leverage things. So we're, we're still in the mode of like ironing out all the kinks in the system. So it doesn't break when we're gone, but the goal would be get it, get it to the point where it operates and we can step away from it. And we have like a COO who, who runs it and understands the business even at a higher level than we do. So it is awesome. And it's nice that you've like even thought about like, okay, I want somebody else to operate it one day. Like it'll still be alive, but somebody else is going to handle it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, th I think we want to get to the point where whether it's like once a week or once a month, you know, maybe we have a meeting with the person running it, check in on things, kind of m more high level strategy type of things. And then have a real, a real operator, like r running the day to day and running and managing the team. I love it. It's awesome. Yeah. So Tim, thank you so much so far. Uh, it's getting towards the end of the show, however, which brings us to the Adventurous Four. These are four exploratory questions that we ask all of our guests. So if you're ready, we will begin the questioning. I'm ready. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> so the first question we have for you, Tim, is where is one place you wish to travel to and why? 
Besides Italy. Besides, well, besides, besides Italy. Well, I am. I'm leaving tomorrow morning for uh, for Italy. So I was gonna I was gonna say that. I am <laughs> excited for that. I will say I'll say Japan then. Okay. I'm a pretty I'm a big big foodie, and I haven't I haven't explored Japan yet. And there's there's something about the simplicity and the high quality of ingredients and just the yeah the, the overall the complexity and the simplistic aspect to it that I'm that I'm super interested in. That's cool. No, I like it. Sorry, I had to talk away your first one, but. I'm I was like, oh, I have to, I have to get it off before he does. I know, that was, that was, that was, it was such a good answer too. <laughs> so the second question is, what is one thing on your bucket list and how are you leveraging real estate investing to achieve it? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a pretty big baseball fan. And so I've been to, I think about 20, 22 different baseball stadium. And I want to go to all, I guess they constantly change teams move in and out of stadiums, but there's 30 baseball stadiums right now. So I want to go to a baseball game at all 30 stadiums and you know, in real estate, you get to travel a lot. You get to check out different markets and things. So I always try to tack on a major league game or a minor league game on whatever city I'm in. So I've like never met another human who has that same like want because that's what I want. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's uh, there's only there's only so many of us baseball dorks out there. <laughs> Ooh, that's wild. Uh, yeah, right when you started to say it, I was like, there's no way. <laughs> so that's just awesome. That's awesome. I haven't. I've, I've been oh, a yeah. couple, but... Yeah, you know. it's just me. <laughs> That's cool. That What's your favorite one so far? Favorite baseball stadium? I'll say Wrigley Field. I lived yeah. in Chicago for a couple of years, and there's nothing like the, the energy at, in Wrigleyville during the summer. It's an, it's an awesome experience. You don't, you don't even have to like baseball. And going to that game will like will change your appreciation for like what baseball can be. I like so, it. I do. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Question though. Oh. So like, <laughs> just curious yeah. about this whole thing. I know it's kind of a tangent, but so like the Braves stadium, right? And moved. If you saw a game in the old stadium, would you want to then go see a game in the new stadium that they built? Good, good question. It becomes complicated at that yeah. point. I mean, I've seen the Braves. Is it <laughs> stadium? Yeah. Stadium yeah I mean, I, I think I want to see every stadium I can. And then the ones like I didn't get to go to the old Yankee Stadium and I've been to the new Yankee Stadium a couple of times. So I'm counting that. I'm checking it off the list because I can't go to the old one. But yeah, yeah. My minor league games too. Those are, okay, those cool. are good. I'm interested in, in all, all things baseball. That's awesome. cool. <laughs> all right, cool. Just had to clarify. The third question we have for you, what is one piece of advice for someone who wants to start just investing in real estate? Yeah, I think in, it's more of, more of two things, I guess, is like education and networking. I think each of those is like valuable on its own. But if you're only focused on one side of that, you're going to be really missing out. If you're head down in the books, just trying to learn everything you can about real estate and you're not talking to people, you're never going to understand how that works in, in the real world and you're not going to develop relationships. If you're only networking with people and you're just talking to people and you don't know the fundamentals of investing and like what you're getting into, I think you're going to be really easily, you know, potentially like manipulated by whoever has the best sales pitch and you're not going to understand like the X's and O's. So I think it's a healthy balance of get your education up, understand what you're getting into. But also go out and talk to people and see who you're comfortable investing with, who your philosophy aligns with, and try to navigate that as evenly as you can. Education, talking to people. No, I like it. That's a really good answer. I like how you went into that because I was like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> That's the thing. So then the fourth and final question is, if you had unlimited resources available to you, how would you leave an impact? Yeah, I think I think there's our, our country, it doesn't do a very good job of like educating people on options for, I guess, just financial literacy. Mm -hmm. In general, and you know, options outside of you know going to school, going to a university, and and going and getting a job and working for a four hundred one k your entire life. So I think I'd spend a lot of time trying to you know help like reform and provide other options and education for people who you know just to get fundamental financial literacy first, so people aren't getting into the real world and you know not understanding what they're yeah, yeah what 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 they're doing and uh, yeah just provide options for people too who who have an entrepreneurial mindset to get into that like earlier in life. And, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate that I found my way into it and I kind of like, you know, got, got lucky there, but I think there should be more options for people to understand that, that, you know, owning a business and, you know, providing for yourself is, is a, a viable career path. I mean, so, yeah, that's awesome for sure. So thank you so much, Tim. I appreciate it. Would you mind sharing with our adventurous family a little bit or how to find you or reach out to you and in contact with you? Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to get more active on my Instagram right now. It's Tim underscore McGarvey. Shoot me a DM. We'll set up a time to talk. I love talking to uh, to like-minded people and people who are interested in, in real estate. And then my company's website is venture-stack.com. We sell off-market properties in North Carolina right now. 
And if you're looking for a good deal, check out what we what we have to offer. Cool. Thank you so much. And we'll have all of that in the show notes so that everybody can find it super easily. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, Tim, for joining us today. I hope you have a great day and I hope you have a great trip in Italy. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for having me. This was really fun. And I'll send you guys some, some photos from my trip. Please this do. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Awesome. So until next time, explore more adventure ways. Woo! 